It's book release week. Ooh. Martyr's Faith for a Faithless World. It comes out tomorrow, I think. That's Tuesday. Maybe it's today, if this is the day I'm getting the video uh, posted. But anyway, I asked for questions about the book on the Facebook, and you guys sent them to me. So I answer a bunch of questions about a martyr's faith for a faithless world. Is it just about the martyrs? Does it have anything to do today? Who's it for? What's it for? And all that sort of stuff. I answer those questions. So thank you for the questions. God be praised. Hopefully this answer is uh, helpful for you. And if you do pick up the book, Martyr's Faith for Faithless World, that's CPH published at Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and anywhere you buy books, you know, the back of the guy's truck down the street or whatever, wherever you pick up your books, it should be there. And uh, when you do, I'd love a couple of things. I'd love your feedback on it. In fact, if you go and, and rate and comment on the book, like at CPH and Amazon and whatever, that is really helpful. If you want to be helpful and you want more people to find the book and pick it up, that is maybe the way to be the most helpful. And then if, you're, if you'd like to do something like a study or a book study or you have questions on it, if you send me those questions, I'm going to make videos answering questions about the book as well. So that, w- that would be great. Uh, you can send me those questions and hopefully we'll, we'll answer them. In fact, if you want to do a church Bible study, uh, you can do it and maybe, I don't know, show the video and then talk about it. I don't know if that'll be helpful, but if it would be helpful, it'd be fun. Uh, to give that a try again. So, so here's this uh, here's this week's episode of Cross Defense, all about a martyr's faith for a faithless world. Thank you. Ah, woo-hoo. Welcome to Cross Defense. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolf. You there? And it's that time, that time of the week where we talk about the cross, where we let the we. This is the idea of Cross Defense. We want the scriptures to sort of set our imaginations on fire with the goodness of God's word. Uh, and the kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we not only j- learn the scriptures, but we delight in the scriptures. That's that's the thing that we're after uh, here on Cross Defense, and that's what we're going to do today. I, uh, in fact, just by the way, uh, um, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller here, pastor of, of uh, St. Paul Lutheran and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Church in Austin, Colorado. And a program note before we get started, uh, starting, I hope, next week, we're going to start a series an apologetic series with my friend, Pastor Brian Flammy, asking some of the tough questions, like why is there suffering in the world? How do we respond to evolutionism and some of the other tough questions uh, that are asked? So so that'll start next week. But today, this is kind of a special week for me. God be praised, I had the privilege to uh, to write another book, A Martyr's Faith for a Faithless World, and it comes out I think the official day is tomorrow. It's been you've been able to pre-order it on Amazon and CPH, and I think even the like the the Kindle version has been available uh, for a few days. But tomorrow, I mean, so this week is is the week. So I thought uh, if, if you guys would indulge me, we just talk about the this book. And I, I sent a note out on the Facebook saying, "Hey, uh, w- what questions?" Because it's kind of weird to interview yourself. And so you guys are sending in questions. If you're listening live, if you want to submit a question. You probably send one to me on Twitter. It's B Wolfmuller on Twitter. I never know how to actually check Twitter, but you go to Facebook if we're connected on there and and send a, a question there, and uh, and we'll try to answer some of the questions about the book, A Martyr's Faith for a Fla- Faithless World. I hope it'll be helpful to you. Um, and in fact, that's one of the first questions that was here. Uh, oh, where is it now? These there's so many questions I can't find it. Um, yeah, here. So here's a question. Derek, for example, asks. What was your original goal in writing the book, and how does it change as you wrote it or completed it? And then uh, my friend Pastor Thorson, Brian Thorson, writes, I think you said you wrote the book for your daughter as she goes to college. How is the book useful for students? That's both true. The, this book came about, I was asked a couple of years ago, maybe this is like five years ago now, to be a mentor for a student, uh, for a confirmation student and for at, at another congregation. I was glad to do so. And this confirmation class had the kids read some different books. And one of the books was a, was a book. It wasn't a Lutheran book. It was written by an evangelical. And it was about ha- having your own faith, a mature, having a mature faith, moving from having your parents' faith to having, you know, having your own faith. And I read that book, and I was just... Uh, it was... Okay, let's just say it nicely. It was not good. And I thought to myself, well, I can... I can probably do better than this. I'd say something helpful for the kids at this very important time. I mean, you're finishing up confirmation. You're becoming a, a young adult. Maybe even you're leaving. You're finishing high school. You're going off to college, and the devil is just after you. He's just pounding you. And so, how do you? How how what what helpful things do we have to say, especially for kids in these circumstances? So, as I saw my daughter Hannah getting closer and closer 
to that time. And that's happened now. She left for school last week. She had her first full week at college uh, this last week. And as I saw that coming, I said, man, I want to I want to think about that. I want I want to think about the things that that I would want to tell Hannah about the faith so that she could have it written written down. Um, I've had the custom for the last few years of at Christmas and at the kids' birthdays of, of writing them a, a letter, just a sort of reflection about um, my own love for them and and tr- trying to give them some wisdom from the scriptures and and so forth. But I thought you know this is it kind of calls for something a bit more substantial. So I wanted to. That's that's kind of that's how the book really started, and I thought I was thinking and, and meditating a lot on the on the vow that we take at confirmation. It's really kind of credible. If you if uh, if you're not familiar with the Lutheran uh, Church and the Lutheran tradition, one of the things that we do is to get kids ready for the Lord's Supper. We we have a confirmation class or a catechism class where they study the basics of Christian doctrine, and then and then when it's time, they'll make a public confession of their faith. This is what I believe. This is what I desire to do. And, and one of the vows that they'll make is, a, is the martyr's vow. Will you forsake all, give, give up everything, even life, rather than fall away from this confession? Now, that doesn't mean I'd, I'd rather die than, than leave this particular church, this particular congregation, but this particular doctrine, this doctrine of law and gospel, this is the most precious thing to me. It's even more precious than my life. And I was I was meditating on that, what that means, what, what, it, what it has meant in the history of the church. And, and so, so that led to this reflection of, well, what if we studied the martyrs a little bit? And what if we studied how it was that the martyrs could endure everything, could actually keep this promise? They, they lost everything, even their lives. They suffered everything, even death, for the sake of confessing Christ. So, so that led me to the martyrs. And as I, as I was leading into the martyrs, I was realizing, well, Okay, this is going to have a limited sort of helpfulness. There's a lot of studies of the martyrs. You can go out and find a lot of martyrologies, is what they're called, books about the lives and the deaths of the martyrs. And some of them are pretty good. Some of them are full of kind of crazy legends and goofy miracles and kind of cultivates this cult of the saint sort of stuff. But, but I was asking, well, how, how is this helpful for us? How does Jesus uh, want to strengthen our own faith? And I had a kind of... I think when I first started outlining the book, I had 20 or th- maybe maybe it was more than that, 30, 35 sort of disconnected chapters. And as I was writing and thinking about these things, a pattern started to develop around the ways that our faith is attacked, about the ways that the devil would, would put us off of this confessing Christ and, and, and confessing the truth to the world and to our neighbor. And, uh, and so it, the, the, the book sort of naturally... Uh, shaped itself into an exposition of the parable of the sower. And if you want an outline for the book, that's really what it is. There's five, there's five parts to the book, and those are the five parts of the parable of the sower. Jesus tells this parable. It's such a beautiful parable. He says a sower uh, goes out to sow the seed, and some falls on the path, and some falls in the rocks, and some falls in the weeds, and some falls in the good ground. So part one is about the word uh, the, the word is under attack. Part two of the book, it, it, it says the devil, the birds are the devil. And it's about spiritual warfare and about how the devil attacks our faith. The, the third part of the book is uh, in the, no, no, uh, the, the storm of suffering or the, oh, I have the, I had to print out the thing. I don't have a copy of the book yet. I had to print out the, I had to print out the, the uh, table of contents here. So part three is the assault of suffering. And how, and how the devil attacks our faith with suffering. Then the fourth part is in the weeds. And this is interesting. It's particularly a discussion of, um, of the dangers of the pleasures of this life. And then the fifth part is good dirt and how the Lord Jesus makes us good dirt. He gives us faith so that we continue to trust in him. And in fact, what happened is more, in, more than being a book about the martyrs, this book is in fact about how the world, the flesh, and the devil attack our faith and how the Lord Jesus sustains it. I just looked because I was curious about, you know, I'm, this is the kind of week that I'm allowed to be curious about these sort of things. And I was, I was trying to remember why I've forgotten so much of what I wrote. And, I, and you know the way this thing goes is that books are due a lot before they're published. So this, the final manuscript for this book, A Martyr's Faith, was due at the editor on December the 1st. And I found today that I submitted it on December the 3rd. I think that's pretty good, actually. Only, only two days late. 
And, uh, and in the letter that I sent to Scott Kinneman, who's my editor at CPH, and just a great, I mean, a great friend to me all the way through this process. I mean, it's I- invaluable uh, to have his help and his input. But I sent a letter and, and I said, hey, this, this book is shaped up to be a lot different than I, I was planning it to be. This, I, this outline of the, of the parable of the sower wasn't even in my mind when I started writing and putting this thing together. But it, I think it, it flowed out quite nicely. So, so the whole thing is that it's like a 200-page exposition of the parable of the sower is really what it is. Um, and, uh, and there you go. So thanks for that question. I can't remember even what question I was answering, but more questions are coming in. But here's the first one. This is from uh, Pastor Richard Mitwitty. Pastor Mitwitty, by the way, if you guys don't know who Pastor Mitwitty is, he's the campus pastor down here at the University of Texas uh, in Austin. And so if you know of any students that are going to the University of Texas, uh, send me their information, or and I'll get it to Pastor Mitwitty. He's doing great things uh, down there at the University of Texas, both with the students and especially with grad students and foreign students and, uh, and his ESL classes. Uh, he's a great, great guy, Pastor Mitwitty. But he's got a question. He says, simply put, what is it that you really want readers to get from the book? Well, it has to be the hope of a, of a pastor and of a father that, that the Lord uses the stuff that we do in the Scriptures to strengthen and sustain faith. And that is, that is my hope. My hope is that through this text, the Lord Jesus uh, would send his Holy Spirit to sustain faith in the midst of challenges. And one of the ways that I think the Holy Spirit does this is it simply lets you, lets you name things and lets you gear your expectations. So for whatever reason, I don't know where this idea comes from, but we just have the idea that the Christian life is just some sort of, I don't know, that that, that faith in Jesus makes things easier or whatever. That, that it, it kind of it makes this life better. It's like it's not, our, our faith is never going to be challenged. Well, that's not, that's not what the Bible says. And the Bible says constantly that our faith is under attack. I mean, that's kind of part one. Your faith and my faith is under attack. Our, our understanding of the Bible is under, is under attack. Our confessing the truth of Jesus is under attack, that we, we are under the attack of the devil. And so we've got to know it and realize that the attack comes from three directions. We have the attack of the devil, we have the attack of suffering, and we have the attack of pleasure. They, and they seem opposite to us. I mean, we see, you know, I was, uh, I was reading Aristotle this weekend, accidentally. <laughs> and Aristotle's talking about pleasure and pain. It's really interesting to see how he talks. I mean, he's a heathen, but he does pretty good. I mean, he does, he does pretty good with what he's got, but he... He, he's, he's wrestling with this. Is pleasure good or is pleasure bad? Is pain good or is pain bad? And it, and it sort of depends. Well, we, we tend to fall on one or the other. Either the devil is going to attack us with pleasure or the devil is going to attack us with pain. But it, ter- turns, it, it turns out that he uses them both to attack us. He, 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 he attacks from both sides. But the great thing about that is that the Lord uses both also to bless us, to pleasure and pain. And so we got to wrestle through those sorts of things. So to recognize that, the, that we are under attack, to, to be able to name what the attack is, to understand how the devil attacks faith, hope, and love, about how the devil attacks our conscience, about how the three estates in God's ordering of the world protects us in the attack. The longest section of the book is the second section, which is about spiritual warfare and, and where the battle is, what the battle is, what the goals that the devil has, how do we fight back and resist him and so forth. That's, the, that's a big section to, uh, of the text so that we recognize that we're all in spiritual warfare. And the goal, really, and maybe this is back to the first question, the goal is not that we would all become martyrs, that we'd all be like fed to the lions or have our heads cut off or something like that, but that we would all endure, that we would have faith to the end, that, that the Lord would sustain our faith and carry us through the troubles of this life and into the life to come. So that is the goal of the book, and hopefully, uh, and hopefully it'll help some do that. Kyle writes, Kyle Bliss writes, what do you think the most important thing we can learn from the martyrs is in our modern context? That is a great question, Kyle. Man, oh man. There's so much. One of the things that I think is so helpful about reflecting on the martyrs is that, and, and we've talked about this a lot on, on this show before, but we live in a time when we just despi- when we despise our heroes. 
I mean, there's no, there's really no heroes, or we we have more anti-heroes than we have heroes. Even the kind of comic book people are sort of, they're they're they they're the anti-hero, the bad guy who tries to do something good, and maybe there's something, there's some story of redemption or something in there. But but we just we we have an anti-heroic age. I mean, even just politically, like you try to talk about politics and George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or any of these. Guys, it used to be the old American heroes, and people are like, "Hey, you know, get you got to look how bad they were. Look at how you know they were racist and all this sort of stuff." We so we live in this very anti-heroic age, and I think that's bad because you we really establish our ethics around our heroes. Our heroes, the people that we try to emulate in this life, are are the people that kind of drive us forward. They give us what life ought to look like, and it gives us something to strive for. Maybe. Maybe that's why we don't like the heroes is because the heroes we see are people who are just better than us. And we want we for whatever reason, we want to think that there was nobody better than us. Well, that's crazy. I mean, there's bajillions of people who are better than me at all sorts of stuff. And I want to look up to them. It's OK to look up. We so want to look down and despise people, but we want to look up and have and have heroes in this life. And the martyrs are the typical Christian heroes. I mean, for generations and generations. The martyrs have been the people that the church has looked up to and said, this is what, this is what the, uh, the Christian life is like. In fact, Luther, now how about this for challenging? Luther says that the, the martyr is the typical Christian life. Now that is an amazing thing to think about. In other words, giving your life for the name of Jesus is what the normal Christian life is like. It's not the exceptional Christian life. It's the normal Christian life. And we who don't expect to give up our lives are the exceptions. <laughs> we, we are the outliers. We are the, we are the weird ones who didn't, who didn't love our lives uh, 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 or di- didn't hold, cling to our lives even to death, didn't love our lives all the way to death. That's how it says it in Revelation 12. We're, we, we're the strange ones that don't have to to bleed and die for the, for the sake of Christ. So the martyrs show us what, what a Christian life is like. And this is what Jesus says when he says, take up your cross and follow me. Now, it, it won't be for everybody to lose their life for Christ. It won't be for all of us to be, you know, brought to the lion's den and all this sort of stuff. But, we, but we'll be ready for it. And if the Lord gives it to us, we're ready. And if he doesn't, then we give thanks to him that he preserves our life and, and keeps us safe. So the, the martyrs teach us what it means to suffer and to confess Christ and die. And in another way, and this is kind of strange for us, but the martyrs teach us what it's like to strive for the victory of death. And we, we for whatever reason, we, we are trying to avoid death. Now, it's not, we shouldn't pursue death. We shouldn't throw ourselves off of the, the towers and stuff like this. It, it, our lives are in the Lord's hands. And when it's our days are ending. It's it's that's that's up to the Lord. But but that we're striving towards death. We're not running away from death. In fact, we're running towards it. And when it's time to cross that finish line, we can cross it, maybe exhausted, maybe stumbling across, but we cross it triumphantly to go and see Jesus. The martyrs had a true joy in death. I mean, not just like pretending to to be happy. They had a true joy in death because they knew that death was defeated by the resurrection of Jesus, and that for them to live as Christ and to die is game and if we don't need if we need a lesson th- for these days in the church that's going to be it that that Jesus would teach us how to die well hmm. great question uh, uh Kyle that's fantastic hey we I'm see I'm seeing the signal it's time for I can't believe it's time for a break we're going to go to the break now we'll come back I've got like 50 more questions to answer about the book of martyrs faith for a faithless world that just came out by CPH. You can find it on CPH, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everywhere else you can find books. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. If you get it, leave a comment and a feedback. That really is very helpful. And hopefully it's helpful for you and for your family, for your children uh, and grandchildren as well. We'll talk some more about it right after the break. Stay tuned. You're listening to Cross Defense. Wow. That was quick. I told you that was a quick break. Whew. Uh, hey, the Pastor Wolf there. This is cross defense. Good thing I didn't go get something to drink. Uh, good thing you didn't go get something to drink. We're back. We're taking questions about a Martyr's Faith for a Messed Up. Wait, Martyr's Faith for a Faithless World? That's the name of the book. It comes out this week. Written by yours truly for my daughter, Hannah. Also for my other boys because I don't know if they're listening or not. I dedicated the book to Hannah and then I thought, man, if I do that, I'm going to have to write three more books for the three boys. So this is for all the kids. <laughs> ah! This is for all the kids. 
Uh, it's for, and hopefully it's helpful for, you know, if you got someone in college, someone just struggling through this faith, any, I mean, really it's for any Christian, but it's kind of catechism 2.0 kind of stuff, but it's, it's talking specifically about how the devil attacks the world. And I'm answering questions from the Facebook about the book. I said, Hey, I don't know how, what questions to answer. So you guys are asking me these questions. This is really great. Uh, William asks, William says, should I read past 10 pages? Well, William, good point. That's how far I normally get in books, right? First 10 pages. You know if you're going to like it or not. This is my suggestion. If you're going to read 10 pages of this book, read the last 10 pages. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, William has a serious... I thought he was serious about that. He says, seriously, what are the things that you learned while writing the book? Thank you. There's a lot. I mean, every... You know, it's one of the good reasons to write a book if you've never tried it. I mean, it's, it's like impossible, but it's a good thing to do because you have to learn so much yourself. And there's like... There's like five or six sort of phases that come along in writing a book. But, you know, there's the, you got to get the information, you got to organize the information, you got to try to say it well, and you got to try to say it clear, and, and you got to put it together. It's like, I mean, writing an essay or a sermon is one thing. It's like, um, it's the difference between a race when you can see the finish line and a race when you can't. <laughs> or a race where you can't see the finish line and a race where you, when you don't know where the finish line actually is. <laughs> Just run till we tell you to stop. <laughs> so it's, you know, you got to kind of plot things out a little bit when you're, when you're writing. But uh, for this one, I learned a bunch about the parable of the sower. That was really helpful, uh, especially about suffering. It's inter- um, I never noticed this before, but you know the parable of the sower, Jesus says, some falls amongst the rocks and it grows up and the sun comes out and it beats down on the plant and the plant withers and dies and you think, well, whose fault is it? It's probably the fault of the sun, right? It's the heat that causes the plant to wither. But Jesus says, no, it's because it had no root. And this is an interesting thing that we often think that it's, it's suffering that causes our faith to weaken or actually to be destroyed. But Jesus doesn't say it's the fault of the sun. In fact, if the plant has roots, then the sun is a good thing for it. And th- this is the point. If, if we have root, if we're grounded in the scripture, then our suffering not only is not bad for our faith, but it actually strengthens our faith. That was a really good thing. Uh, also, I, I got to do some research just on, a tooth, on the martyrs, which was really great. I got to learn about my famous, my, my favorite martyr is Romanus. It's not very famous martyr. But he's really my hero, and I've told that story to you guys before. He's the Romanus is the guy who he was confessing the eternality of Christ, and so the so the guy, the proconsul, had the soldiers cut holes in his cheeks, and he says, "I thank you, my Lord, for giving me more mouths to praise my God." <laughs> Can you? That is so great. That is. Are you ready? That is cheeky. Uh, that's a dad joke of the martyrs. How about that? That's pretty bad. Anyway, I got to learn about some of the martyrs. It was great. And I also really got to dig in to Luther's theology of the martyrs. In fact, I wrote this sort of after book. I wrote an essay uh, specifically on how Luther thought of the martyrs. And uh, that might come out as a little booklet or blog post or something. Keep your eye out for that. If you want information about it, you can sign up for the newsletter, Wednesday Whatnot at wolfmuller.co, and you can find out about that when it comes out. So, so that was really great to learn about all of these things as well. Thank you, William, for the obnoxious and then serious question. Uh, Amy writes, Ooh, Amy, this is a really good question. Was Jesus considered a martyr? Oh, 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 oh man. Now, the answer is yes and no. We remember the Greek word for martyr. The Greek martyr is a Greek word, and it just means witness. And so when you, when you read the text, for example, in the book of Revelation, that calls Jesus the faithful witness, that's calling Jesus the faithful martyr. And he does give up his life uh, because, he confesses, uh, because he confesses the truth. And so in one way, Jesus is considered to be the proto-martyr. But but the office of martyr is distinct from the office of redeemer. This is one of the things that got kind of mixed up in the Middle Ages and the, and the whole big sort of martyr cult where uh, people would almost worship the martyrs. No, we have to make sure that, there, that we, we confess the difference between the office of martyr and the office of redeemer. And, uh, and Jesus is our redeemer. He's not just dying because he confessed the truth. He's dying in our place. 
He's our, he is the atoning sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And his death is unlike any other death before or after or ever there will be. Now, there's a lot of parallels between the deaths of the martyrs and the deaths of Christ. For example, St. Stephen, the, proto, the first martyr, uh, who dies in the book of Acts, and he says, remember, as he's praying, as he's being stoned to death, Father, forgive them. So he prays the same prayer of Jesus, and that becomes the martyr's prayer. In fact, you see that prayer over and over again in the lives and deaths of the martyrs, that they're praying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that's an amazing sort of thing to think about. And also, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's what Jesus prayed, and that's what Stephen prayed, and that's what a lot of the martyrs will pray. As they're dying, they're committing themselves, their, their lives, into the, into the hands of God who loved them. But, and so there is a way that the death of Jesus becomes the pattern for the, for, for the Christians that die after him by martyrdom. But Jesus' death is something more. And there's, and there's a profoundness to that, a profound difference. Think about it like this. I was reading about, about this in this old book by P.T. Forsyth this last week when I was traveling somewhere. For some whatever reason, I brought Forsyth with me, and I've hardly ever read anything of his, but he was talking about the difference between the death of Jesus and the death of the martyrs. And he, he made this point that when you hear about the martyrs who confessed their faith and died, who shed their blood for the sake of the name of Jesus, this, this sort of this sense of nobility rises up in us. I mean, the martyrs, in a way, sort of call to us as examples, those who have, who have given up everything, and we want to follow in their footsteps. They're sort of, it's like when you hear the national anthem and patriotism sort of swells in your heart. When we hear the stories of the martyrs, something sort of swells in our heart, and we want to follow after them into that kind of faithfulness. They call us to run after themselves. But when we hear about the death of Jesus, that does not happen. Something else happens. No, no one ever thinks when Jesus is there being beaten and, and, and mocked and stripped and crucified, nobody ever says, yeah, I want to follow after him. We, it just it does have, has a different effect. It's a, and that's a profound thing to notice. And, and the reason is because Jesus is, going, Jesus is going to the cross so that we don't have to. He's going to the cross instead of us. I mean, we follow after Jesus. We are his disciples. And so we follow him through death to life eternal. But we do not suffer as he suffered. He suffers for us. That's what it means to be an atoning sacrifice, a substitutionary atonement. He's, he's there on the cross praying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we can pray, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. I, that we know he'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us and so forth. So that Jesus was, he, yes, he was a martyr. He, in fact, he was probably the martyr, but he is much, much more than that uh, there. Whew, that's a good question, Amy. Wow. Man, I show, if I would have known you guys were going to ask these hard questions. Uh, let's see, Zach. Zach Lesher probably asked an easy one. Why should I buy this book? If you're going to convince me that this is a good resource for my library, please explain how it points to Christ and the apostolic confession of faith. Here, here's what I hope, that the martyrs are helpful to us not because they point to themselves, but because they point to Christ, because they are part of the great cloud of witnesses. And this is the picture of Hebrews chapter 12. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, but our eyes are fixed on Jesus. I, we, we, we hear the martyrs and the, and the faithful confessors and the fathers and the reformers and all these that have gone before us, and they're encouraging us, but our eyes are fixed on Christ. And if this book, A Martyr's Faith for a Faithless World, does not fix our eyes on Jesus, then it is a failure. So I hope and I pray that it, that it does. In fact, uh, one, I, one, someone asked here, what do, you, what do you remember about writing the book? The, the, the most... Um, hmm. The, the, I think the, the most wonderful, well, I don't know, I don't know the adjective for it. The moment I know uh, that I remember most about writing this book is when I wrote the last chapter, chapter 27, Encouragement for the Weary. And I wrote it, it was probably the third chapter that I wrote, actually. And it's a chapter, it's on Hebrews chapter 12, and it's, and it's this encouragement to keep going. And I remember it because... And one of the tricks about being a pastor, I suppose, an author, is you have to also write for yourself. So I have to, I have to, I have to also preach to myself. And 
And so I, I want to hear these things. I want to hear the warnings. I want to hear the promises. I want to hear the in, encouragement as well. And so I was writing this chapter, and I wrote it in one sitting, and it was fast. I remember I was sitting at the second table at the library, Arapahoe County Library in Aurora, Colorado. I was upstairs in the reading room, and I was I had my headphones in, and I was writing, and I was working on Hebrews chapter 12, and I started weeping. And uh, and at first, I so I cried. I, there was a I, there was a tear, and I wiped it away, and uh, and then I just kept going. And the tears were kind of falling as I was in, 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 sort of embracing this picture that Hebrews chapter twelve was painting. And I, and I hope that this is exactly kind of this encapsulates the the book that it's fixing our eyes on Jesus. So for you, Zach, I'll I'll read this. See if this is encouraging to you guys as well. Uh, Encouragement for the Weary, chapter 27. Imagine yourself running a race. It's a marathon, or longer, one of those races that goes on and on. You pass a few people, but mostly everyone has passed you. You're hungry and tired. Your tongue is glued to the roof of your mouth. Your lungs feel like they are stuffed with flaming cotton. You try to sing and pray through the pain. It seems like the race will never end. This is one of those races that ends in the stadium, but it seems like you're nowhere close to the finish. Every time you climb over a hill, all you see are more hills, more track, more running. Your feet drag, your heart pounds, your mind thinks only of quitting, of lying down on the side of the road. But then you hear a sound, faint, in the distance, people cheering. And as you come along, you start to see the stadium in the distance, the track, and the end of the race. The sound gets louder and louder, and you think you hear a familiar voice. You do. As you get closer, you start to see the faces of the people in the stands, and you recognize them, and they see you. Their faces light up when they recognize you, and they cheer even louder. This is the picture given to us in Hebrews 12. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You turn the corner into the stadium, and there in the front row are your grandparents cheering you on, your parents, the friends and family who have died before you. They're yelling, encouraging. You can make it. And suddenly your legs are not so heavy. You see next to them others whom you recognize. There's Martin Luther. There's Martin Chemnitz, the crowd of faithful reformers. And they are cheering you on as well. Stay strong, they say. You're almost to the end. But you, be- you begin to forget your pain, your hunger, your thirst. Further along in the stadium are the church fathers and the martyrs and the apostles. There's Peter. Christ also suffered, he says. Run with joy. There's Paul. Keep the faith, he yells to you. There are Thomas and Matthew and James and John all pushing you on, and you begin to run faster. And you see Jeremiah and Isaiah comforting you. And now it seems as if your feet have grown wings. There is King David. Don't grow weary. There's Joshua. Be strong and courageous, he shouts. There are Moses and Aaron, Joseph and Judah, Abraham and Sarah and Noah with his family and Abel and Adam and Eve. We made it. We finished. You can too. Can you imagine it? There are the heroes. Those who have finished the faith, who finished the race, who kept the faith. The great cloud of finishers. You're running with purpose now, and you make the last turn. You see the finish line. There, standing at the end, is Jesus. His arms are stretched out. He's waiting for you. You see the scars in his hands. His eyes are fixed on you. He smiles. A little further, he says, just a little while, a few more steps, and you're sprinting now. You throw off anything that's slowing you down. Weariness is forgotten. You you can't even hear the crowd anymore. 
Hope is set before you. Hearts are brave again. Arms are strong. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12. Jesus is the beginning, and Jesus is the end. He is the source and the goal, the start and the finish. You will be there soon, and in the meantime, while we labor here below, Jesus waits. He prays for you. He prepares a place for you. He finishes the work that he began in you, and he will bring it to completion in his time. In the end, we're not seeking to have a martyr's faith in a faithless world. We are seeking Jesus. We're striving for him. We're grasping to take hold of his eternal life, knowing that he has already taken a hold of us. He is our finish line, and soon we will reach him. Amen. Well, now, Zach, you don't have to buy it because I just read you the best part. But I hope this is the idea. It's a book that points us to Christ. That's what we're after. Hey, it's time for a quick break. So let's do that now. You're listening to Cross the Fence uh, here on KFUO Radio. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned. Through the short break, we'll be right back. Hey, hey, welcome back to Cross the Fence. Where is Pastor Brian Wolf? You're the pastor of... Yes, <laughs> you guys, apparently, people listening and commenting said that I said that I'm pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Austin, Colorado. If you find that place... Let me know, because it's hot here in Texas. Uh, St. Paul Lutheran Church and Jesus Death Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas. That's where we are right now. And I got to finish uh, back a few months ago, this Martyr's Faith from the Faces. Which now, now it's finished being published, and it ships. I think it ships tomorrow. I keep People keep sending me notes who pre-ordered on Amazon, and they get the, the, well, someone said, hey, I'm getting it September 1st, and someone said September 4th, and someone said September 17th or something like that. So who knows? You guys can go and buy them. And, That'd be kind of cool. Uh, a couple, but I'm answering questions. You guys are sending in on the Facebook some questions. This is a couple of great questions. One, someone asks here. Let me find where this question goes. If this is just for Lutherans, aha! Caitlin asks, uh, "Is this book just for Lutherans? Will this appeal to those friends and family who are still entrenched in American Christianity? Why did you choose the title? What were the other titles that you considered?" The answer. Okay, so a couple questions there. The first is, I really hope so. I mean, I, if it, it is a Lutheran book in the sense that. I mean, I'm I'm not holding anything back. I'm not trying to pretend like I'm I'm not a Lutheran, but it's not a polemical book like has American Christianity failed. At least it's not going after the evangelicals. It's rather it's rather unfolding in a law gospel way the parable of the sower that Jesus tells and telling the stories of the of the saints. So um it's it it should be encouraging for everybody. Uh there might I, I think there might be a couple of places where people would say Hey, wait a minute. I don't know if that's right or not, but I, I don't even, you know, I get into it a little bit about, about baptism and the Lord's Supper. I mean, you can't talk about the faith without talking about those things, but I don't think that there's anything uniquely Lutheran about this book. I hope, I hope that the whole church, the Lord's whole church finds comfort from this book, especially as the persecution of the church intensifies. I mean, we find ourselves that feeling of persecution and, it, and the, this idea that it's coming along and so how do we face up to that in a, in a joyful sort of way? I, I remember I read this book by Rod Dreher, The Benedict Option, which talks about because the world is kind of coming in and, and uh, that there's this sort of a little bit of an alarmist and retreatist sort of attitude. But, but when we realize, hey, we, this is what we signed up for. I mean, this is, what, this is when, we were in, when we were baptized, we were enlisted amongst the, the martyrs. Then that's, I mean, it's great. So, so, so hopefully there's nothing... I mean, hopefully this is for everyone. The second question, Caitlin says, is why did you choose the title? Were there other chi- titles you considered? Yeah, the title, we went around and around. Uh, the first, the first uh, kind of go around for the title was A Faith All Your Own. That's what we were working on. Um, a Faith All Your Own. And that was the idea of, of, of moving from being a child in the faith to, being, to having a mature faith, to having... To, to being able to stand on your own and confess the faith. So moving from the, the, the children's faith to the adult faith. Uh, and then I think it, it had the subtitle, uh, How to Have a Martyr's Faith 
in a messed up world. And then that became the title, Martyr's Faith in a Messed Up World. And then it got changed at some point to Martyr's Faith in a Faithless World. I don't know. I don't know how, how that actually got changed. At some, at some point, in some email thing, uh, that, got, that got shifted around. So, uh, I, I, you know, um, has American Christianity failed? It's a fine title, I suppose. That was originally called um, Surprised by the Gospel. I kind of I like that original title than the title that it ended up with. Ah, it's a little bit here, a little there, but but this one, a martyr's faith for a faithless world. I, I like that. I like that title. I think it fits. Although the reason why it's a li- slightly confusing is it um, it makes it seem like it's a book all about the martyrs, and it's not. There, someone asks, "What martyrs do you talk about?" The answer is there's five martyrs that are discussed: uh, Stephen, Perpetua, Polycarp, Romanus, and Agatha. And, but you'll look at this, how it goes is that I almost just introduce the topics with the story of the martyrs. So I'll tell the story of St. Stephen in three pages, two pages, I think. And then we talk about how the word is opposed. And then Perpetua has three pages, and then we talk about spiritual warfare. Poly- Polycarp has three pages, and then we go on to talk about the assault of suffering. And then Romanus. So they're almost little vignettes, the stories of the martyrs. Uh, but it's not just a book about the martyrs. It's a book about the martyrs' faith. You see, that's the, that's maybe the point. It's not it's not about the martyrs themselves, but about how the martyrs clung to Jesus. Uh, this is that's what Marshall asked. Which martyrs do you talk about specifically? Those five, and then Marshall says, "What can we learn from the ancient and modern martyrs?" Well, this is the the thing that they teach us is how to how to endure, how to cross the finish line, how to how to make it there. Uh, to the end, how to how to stand, how to stand and uh, and take the devil's assaults without fear. It's really great. In fact, we've we've talked about this a lot. I think it, it's so important that Hebrews two tells us that that being afraid of death is the devil's fear. The devil has us in bondage when we're afraid to die, and so the martyrs teach us how to not be afraid to die. It's not just it's not just in their it's not just in their dying, but it's in their being ready to die that, uh, that, that we rejoice and we, and we delight in the Lord's mercy. Uh, I got a question here from Denmark. Nud asks, do, do you in the book find relations between the church father's understanding of martyrdom and the seventh sign of the church in Luther's writing? It's a great question. And I deal with that very specifically in this kind of little after book uh, that I'm working on now, Luther's Evangelical Theology of the Martyrs. Because there is a difference in the way the early church considered the martyrs and in the way that Luther considered the martyrs. Uh, there's a tendency in the early church for the martyrs, there's almost a kind of a cult of the martyrs, and the martyrs were almost little demigods or little mini saviors. They added to their own redemption by their shedding of blood and stuff like that. That kind of that starts to sneak in here and and there and we want to avoid that recognize that we stand with the martyrs they they uh they they're the ones that are running the race with us they're just ahead of us and we're and we're chasing after them but we're all running the same race to achieve the same goal and to be found in Christ at the end of our days so so we don't want to exalt the martyrs but rejoice uh in the fact that the lord gave them the gift of faithfulness to the end it's one of the questions that oftentimes comes up. Whenever I talk about the martyrs, people say, man, oh man, this martyrs are great, but boy, I'm just afraid that I, if I was called on to do something like that, that I would fail, that I would fall short, that I would not be able to remain faithful to the end and confess Christ to the end. And for that, we want to recognize that this is all beginning to end a gift from Jesus. He gives us the endurance. He gives us uh, faith that endures to the end. He, he, he converts us. He keeps us in the faith. He sustains us in the faith. The Lord is the one who's, who's doing this work. And so we can have this great confidence that when the time comes, the Lord will give us the words to speak uh, and, the, and, the, and the boldness to face the suffering uh, that, we, that we have to do uh, when it's time for that. Uh, Nud asks about the seventh sign of the church in Luther's writing. In Luther's little work, the Babylonian, is it Babylonian captivity? Is it Babylonian captivity or on the creeds and the churches? In one of those two places, ooh, that's bad that I can't remember. It's got to be on the councils and the churches. That's where it is. Uh, in, the, on, in his little book, On the Councils and the Churches, 
Luther lists the seven marks of the church. And the first is the gospel and then baptism and the absolution and the Lord's Supper and then I think prayers and good works and then suffering, the Holy Cross, the blessed gift of the Holy Cross becomes a mark of the church, that the Christian church is marked by suffering and by persecution. And it is a unique, I mean, you can find that in the church fathers, but Luther really brings a great clarity to that that didn't exist in the old martyrologies. So now send me a note and um, I'll send you this uh, little essay that I wrote about Luther's theology of the martyrs uh, as well. And that gets into that very specifically. But I don't talk too much about the theology of martyrdom in the book. It's more about mm, these attacks on the faith. Uh, how does re- uh, Karen asks, how does recognizing, remembering the martyred saints tie to the theology of the cross? That's a good question. Theology of the cross. So there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of confusion around this phrase, the theology of the cross. When Luther used it, it comes from a Luther distinction in the Heidelberg Disputation, and he says uh, theology of the cross sees a thing as it really is. A theology of glory is seeking for the hidden things of God and, and so forth. Um, and, and Luther probably, when he's talking about the theology of the cross, theology of the cross recognizes God and the suffering of Jesus and such, he's probably fighting against the scholastic theology that wants to reason its way to the glory of God rather than a biblical theology once wants to get our theology from the history and the text of the scripture. And so that's probably what Luther's talking about with the theology of the cross. He abandons that distinction as far as I can tell in 1518 and never goes back to it, but it's sort of been revised lately. People talk about the theology of the cross a lot, and I think what they mean when they talk about the theology of the cross is... Um, is that we have to talk about the suffering of Jesus and maybe the suffering of the Christian if we want to talk about Christianity rightly. And as far as it goes, as far as it goes, that's right. Uh, the Christian life is a life of suffering. Jesus says, in this world, you will have suffering. That's just, there's no way, there's no way around it. And we suffer spiritually and we suffer physically, we suffer, suffer mentally, we suffer in all these kind of different ways. We suffer grammatically. <laughs> That's a Pirates of the Caribbean reference. Anyway, there's all sorts of suffering in this life, and it doesn't mean that we're not Christians. And so that's true. I mean, the martyrs, the, the, it is an interesting thing when we think about the martyrs. If you, if you just were to pick the people that seem most abandoned by God, it would be that those who were being eaten by lions because they confessed Christ. But no, in fact, those are the heroes of the faith. So that's really great. Um... Let's see, what other questions do we have? Writing for your daughter. Ah, yes. Does the, I, I'm curious, this is from Blaine, who says, I'm, I'm curious about your writing this book for your daughter. Does the book take on a, an apologetic theme to send her into a world of skepticism and misunderstanding? Sort of. Sort of. It's a good question. Uh, in fact, when this book was originally taking place, there was a big section in it on answering the hard questions. And it was going to take on things like uh, biblical criticism, uh, the assault of philosophy, postmodernity and the Christian confession. Uh, what do we say about creation and evolution? Um, h- how do we stand up in, for truth when people don't think that there is a truth, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So it was going to be a lot more apologetic than it ended up being. Um, but there's certainly an apology in there. There's an argument that's being made and a defense that's being ass- assaulted. It, and, it's, and it's maybe recognizing that the, that the devil attacks our heart and our conscience as well as our mind. And so this book is really kind of shoring up the heart uh, and the conscience uh, and, and recognizing those particular assaults. And I think, that, I think that's kind of important. Uh, to do as well. I, I think we're oftentimes tempted to to treat Christianity as if it was completely in the mind, um, but but it seems like the devil's first assault is in the conscience. I'd like to write that, by the way, that apologetics book for the mind, uh, but we'll have to do that next. Joseph says, does the book cover subtle social persecution of the current day at all, or is it 100% specifically about true martyrdom? I would say, Joseph, that it covers it covers 
it covers the subtle social persecution more than it covers the historical uh, takes on the martyrs. So it's talking about the, 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 the assaults of, of suffering that happened to all people and especially to Christians. It's talking about the assault of, of pleasure, the assault of abandoning the faith for the things of this world, the weeds and so forth and so on. And, and it's talking about the way that the devil attacks all of us to destroy our faith and our hope and love. And so it's a lot. It, uh, this book, uh, I do not. Ex- this is not like a handbook for those of you who expect to be he- be beheaded. <laughs> this is not. It's not what it is. It's a handbook for the Christian who faces the assaults of the devil and the world and the flesh every day. So I think it's actually more about that than it is about the than about the martyrs who actually gave up everything. Well, there you go. I uh, I think I ran, I ran through a lot of your questions, and I'm getting the timer. Here, wow, that is pretty good timing. I wonder if I can read. I, I wonder if I could read a little bit uh, more for you guys. Let me just pick a page here, and I'll read a couple of minutes worth. Um, in the parable of the sower, here's just a way to end. Uh, the devil only steals. He only destroys. He only diminishes. Still, he tempts our flesh to have more, more fun, more pleasure, more riches, more leisure, more whatever. But it's an empty more, a vain abundance, fleeting at best. The desires of the flesh are corrosive and destructive. In the parable of the sower, the weeds choked the good plants. It's no accident that Jesus uses this language. The pleasures of this life are strangling. They eat away at what is good. They pry us away from what is holy. They tickle us towards a whimpering death. The color is slowly drained. The sap drips out of life until there is nothing less. We feast on rot and ask for more. Jesus has the true more. He is the true abundance. He is life so abundant that it never ends. True pleasure, true joy, and true contentment are found in him. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, verse 4. Well, there you go. Martyr's Faith for Faithless World. hope it's helpful to you. Send me your thoughts and your questions. This is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. Thanks again for listening to Cross Defense. We'll catch you next week. God's peace be with you. Uh, Greg asked, this question came in after the radio show, but Greg asked, uh, the Great Commission says, go and make disciples. How would I be better prepared to do that after reading your book? That's a great question. I think that there's two, there's two reasons why Christians don't talk about their faith. And I think that it's two versions of the same thing. I think it's fear. I think it's fear. If there's other reasons, then comment, let me know. Uh, that would be really great. But it's fear of not knowing what to say, and it's fear of what people might think. Now, um, there's some training to get over the first fear. But, you know, really, look, if you know the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed, uh, if you know the basic outline of the Scriptures, if you know law and gospel, you know enough to talk to people about Jesus. That's, I mean, you know enough. There's, there's, it's, not, it's not hard. And if you don't, if you're talking to someone and, and there's some, they ask a question and you don't know the answer, then you just say, well, I don't know the answer to that. There's nothing wrong with that. It happens to me like 20 times a day. But the second fear, the fear of what people will think about us, I, I think that's especially addressed by the martyrs. When we see them with such great boldness and, 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 and lack of fear, and in fact, with some like Agatha and, and Perpetua who are mentioned in the book, they, they stand up in front of the, like the boldest of, um, of emperors and rulers. And, and without, without any, they're young girls and they have no fear at all because they belong to, their lives belong to Jesus. Then that also encourages us. And we're, so, so that we become unafraid. That's what the martyrs teach us, to be unafraid. What, what can the devil do? Take they our life, goods, fame, child, and wife. Let these all be gone. They yet have nothing won. The kingdom ours remains. So I hope the answer to the question is, uh, yeah, in fact, yes. That I have a stronger faith in Christ and, and, uh, and a, a fearlessness to be Christian uh, in this world that's fallen apart. To treasure what we have. To not be ashamed of what we have, but to, uh, to, not, to not be ashamed of the gospel, but to confess it boldly. So thanks for the question, Greg. Uh, and thank you guys for watching all the way to the end. Whew, another long uh, video. Uh, thank you guys for for oh, being to the end. It's good. <laughs>